All right, let's uh, let's make a start. So it it is lovely to see those who are in the in the civic hall. <clears throat> We're just doing a little rearranging of some furniture, um, but it's uh, it's lovely to see those who are met and gathered here, and uh, lovely to welcome you as well if you are watching online. Maybe. Maybe you're on a holiday and you're not watching in the, in the Canforth area and you're uh, taking half-term break somewhere else. Um, but it's uh, lovely to see you, um, whether you're online or in person. We're, we're going to start this morning by, um, by reading some words from Philippians. So I'll read them for us, um, but they're on your order of service as well if you want to follow them. This is, uh, this is what Paul says. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now, being confident of this. That he who began a good work in you will carry on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. And it's wonderful to be part of God's family. Wonderful to be a part of of the family here as well at CFM and to pray with joy for one another. And so I'm going to do that as we begin. And uh, and then Dougie's going to come and lead us in some singing. Let's bow our heads and pray for a moment. Father, thank you so much for um, the beautiful day that you've given us today. Thank you for Sundays, uh, days that we can um, set aside, days that can be different, days that help us uh, to, to mark the week and to remember you and to remember um, our, our fellowship as well. Lord, we want to, to thank you for all who make up our church. Lord, we thank you for each home and family that's represented it represented and lord we uh, we thank you for being belonging to you part of your body part of your work here on earth lord we thank you that we get to meet together and uh, lord we pray that in this time this morning uh, lord you'll help us to, to praise you uh, to learn more about you and to um, and to grow in what it is to be your follower Lord, we give this time to you and we give you ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, We're going to sing two songs. Uh, First of all, Amazing Grace, and then uh, All the People Said Amen. Um, The... The words in Amazing Grace in one of the verses it says, My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Saviour has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy uh, reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Uh, That's the chorus. Uh, So we're going to sing that a few times and and the traditional words to some of the verses. So please stand. Um, You can can sing to yourself. uh, Don't sing out loud. But please stand and hopefully these words um, um, bring peace and guidance to you. Please stand.
second verse in this next song says if you're rich or poor it doesn't matter weak or strong you know love is what we're after we're all broken but we're all in this together God knows we stumble and fall and he so loved the world he sent his son to save us all all the people said amen give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends all the people said amen It's, uh, it's time to talk to, uh, to the church family uh, and to, to all of us, but maybe in particular to, uh, to the children this morning. And, uh, and I, hope that, uh, I hope that you have a really wonderful half term. I think that there are some of the, the children who have birthdays this week. So if you have a birthday this week, I hope you have a really happy birthday. And, uh, and I hope you have a, a good holiday from school. If you get really bored... Um, then um, draw me a picture and send it to me. Then that would be great. Um, but uh, I'd, love to, I'd love to see a little bit of what you're doing over the half-term break. 
but have a, have a good time. Okay, so you might remember a couple of weeks ago that we had a bit of a challenge, and the challenge was could a little orange race to the bottom of a jug of water? So that was, that was a real thrill. Well, here we've got, another, we've got another challenge, and it involves this piece of paper here. So Chelsea and Alicia can see this at the back. Now, here's the challenge. Um, I'm going to try and get this piece of paper over my head. In fact, let's go all out over my whole body. Why not? Okay, so here we go. Let's try and pull the paper down over my head. Well, that doesn't seem to be working. It, it, it seems as though that might be impossible to get this piece of paper over my head. Sometimes there are things in life that seem impossible. But maybe there's a way that we can do it. I sure hope so. So with just uh, these, piece, these scissors that I was just throwing on the floor before, I will uh, endeavour to cut this paper and see if we can get it to go all the way over my head. It's become quite an extreme sport, hasn't it, the children's talks? It's been a real excitement for us all. There are lots of things that seem impossible in life. And in the Bible, there's lots of times where God's people seem like they're in impossible situations. So David, little David, was fighting against a huge big giant called Goliath. You might remember that. There are times when people like Gideon are fighting against a whole army and they don't have hardly any fighters, just 300. And God still comes through for them and they're still victorious, they still win, even though it looks impossible. Uh, we'll keep going. And you know the biggest thing that seems impossible in the Bible is how on earth are we going to be able to live with God? How, how can we, though we're not perfect, we make mistakes, we get things wrong, we're sinful, how on earth are we going to live with a holy God? Well, God makes the impossible possible. So now, after a bit of creative cutting, it's easy. It goes right over my head and will it go over my whole body? Oh, yes. That's the closest I'll get to dancing at the front of church. <laughs> A little Ella Shaw shimmy, they call that. More seen on a football field than on a church. But what, uh, but, but what seemed absolutely impossible actually is possible. And here's the thing I want you to remember today, children. With God, what seems impossible is made possible. And so how are we going to live with God? That seems impossible, but it's made possible by Jesus. Jesus makes what is impossible possible. Christy's going to be looking a bit later on about a, a bit of a conflict in the church. And sometimes unity can seem impossible. But with Jesus, it's possible. And so as you go into this week and there are situations that you face, I don't know what those situations are going to be. But as you face things, and it might seem difficult or challenging, I want you to remember with Jesus, it's possible. Okay, With Jesus, it's possible. Maybe something good that we can all remember this week. I'm going to pray now, and, uh, and after I've prayed, Christy's going to come up and, and share the message, so we'll just move the camera a little bit around. Okay, let's, let's pray. If you're at home, it'd be good if you could, uh, could just maybe put your hands together or, or just close your eyes so that we are together as we pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the sunshine outside. We thank you for some warm weather. We thank you for each other. We thank you, Lord, for um, all your kindness to us in lots of ways. And we thank you that you're a God who makes what is impossible possible. That you make it possible that we can know you and follow you and love you. That we can be known as yours. Lord, we thank you that you can make things that are impossible, possible. You can bring hope. You can bring healing. You can bring restoration. You can bring peace. You bring significance. Lord, we thank you for what all that you bring to us. This morning, Lord, we think of those who are having a hard time at the moment. 
Some of those people we know and we know their names and some people we don't perhaps know. But we lift the, those who are having a difficult time before you. For those struggling with their health or with the health of a loved one. Those who are um, facing uncertainty or challenges. We lift them before you. Father, we pray for those who are on half term this week. We pray for the families, for the children, for the teachers. We pray for rest and refreshment. Father, we pray. <coughs> Father, we pray for those who have had uh, or finished exams. Those who are looking into uh, a long summer and, and whatever might come next. We pray for those too. And Father, we thank you that wherever we're at in the spectrum, whether we're feeling good or feeling sad, feeling hopeful or, or feeling in need of a boost, we thank you, Lord, that we can meet together as your people. We're thankful that we belong to you and to each other. And we're thankful that we have the Bible, which helps us understand more of you and more of life. And we pray now as Christy comes to open the Bible with us and read it and share it with us, Lord, we pray that we might know and understand more of you. And we might just not know it, but we might put it into practice what we learn. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be able to enjoy the sunshine, I guess, and uh, everybody's enjoying it, some more than others. And uh, for once, it looks like there's a bank holiday ahead where it's not going to rain, which is great. If you've been listening to the news this week, probably one thing was prominent is how two close allies, probably close friends, had fallen apart. Dominic Cummings. Uh, and well, not necessarily just the Prime Minister, but probably part of the government as well. Just real clash and uh, revelations and accusations that are flying on both sides. And, and that happens in real life. It, it happens to all of us. We, we've been in situations at home or at work or with our friends where we just disagree and there's a conflict coming. And you might be relieved to know that it happens to Christians as well, because it's in the Bible. And while Paul, until now, in the letter that is written to the Philippians, he talked a lot about theology and humility and unity. Now he's getting to the reason why he brought the theology first, because there is an issue in the church in Philippi. And this is where we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at the conflict between two Ladies in the church in Philippi, and uh, if you've got a Bible, just open it up with me in Philippians chapter 4. We're going to read two verses, verses 2 and 3. Philippians 2, 4, verses 2 and 3. This is what Paul is writing to the church. I plead with you all, dear, and I plead with Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. I plead, Paul is saying, I plead with you, Odia and Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. The first thing that really strikes me here, you've got to remember that this is a letter that Paul is writing. And he would send back the letter with Epaphroditus, who was Paul's uh, friend and also a representative of the church in Philippi, who came to bring money to Paul, who was in house arrest in Rome. And he comes, but he will make the journey back. And as he makes the journey back, he will take the letter. And the custom at the time would have been that 
the representative that came to get the letter from Paul, in this case, Epaphroditus, would stand before the church in Philippi and read it out loud. Shock, horror. So this is not private stuff. This is public. And this is the first thing that you'll be realizing that this is quite amazing, that Paul is challenging the conflict. Conflict is being challenged in the church. Now, we, we have this sort of uh, idyllic view of church, and we think that just because we're all Christians and we get together, there is never any disagreement, and we never fall out, and we never dislike, and we never have things that we have different views on. False. It's not true. And this is showing to us the reality that even in the church, between two Christians, there can be conflict. So I'm saying, great. We're normalizing this. We're saying what we already know, it's happening. And Paul is challenging this. And to us, it feels a little bit shocking. Imagine that we would get a letter. Imagine that Pastor Ian would go away uh, in, in his trip to Hawaii. I don't know if I'm being prophetic or not. And in his trip in Hawaii, he decides to write a letter to the church. And then he, he's been hearing some stuff. And he, he's been hearing that Dougie and Andrew have fallen out over something. So he's sending me the letter, and I'm standing before the church, because I'm going to Hawaii as well, you know, just to get the letter and just to encourage you. And I'm coming back, and I'm bringing the letter, and I'm saying in the reading of the whole church... A message from Pastor Ian, Dougie, Andrew, be of the same mind in the Lord. In other words, stop fighting with each other, stop quarreling, stop having an argument. And being in a British environment, probably everybody not knowing what's going to be happening, they go, oh! The strange thing is, probably everybody in the church in Philippi knew that there was an issue in the church. They knew about the conflict between Yordia and Syntyche. And as soon as Paul, through his letter, is addressing it, people are going, oh, can't believe he's just said it. Can't believe it's out now, it's public, it's being addressed. But that's the healthy biblical way. And that's the way Paul reacts to it. He speaks on it publicly because there's a lot at stake. We might say, well, why didn't just Paul send a little note with a letter, a little note to Yordia, or a little note to Syntyche, or even better, say to Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus, when you get back to Philippi, just pop into Starbucks, other places are available, and get Euodia and Syntyche with you, and read to them this little other letter that I've sent. Paul doesn't do that, because this is significant for the whole church, and it's an important thing. Why? First of all, internally, the conflict could have been destructive. This would not have been a very large church, and everybody knew everybody. And what could have been happening is that probably Euodia had some friends and family, and Syntyche had some friends and family, and before you know it, it's not just a conflict between two people, this is a conflict where other people are getting drawn into the conflict, and it's messy. It's when families and friends are beginning not to talk to each other and not to look at each other. And it's like, I'm not gonna go to the prayer meeting if those are coming to the prayer meeting as well. I'm not going to join them. If they're coming to the barbecue and Jacob's joined, mm, they can come. I'm not going to go. And suddenly you've got a whole church being dragged into a conflict between two people. And Paul is saying, we need to talk about this all together here and we need to address it publicly. The other one would have been a witness to the outside world. Imagine that they would have had friends and family who suddenly begin to hear about it. We're naive, we think that whatever's happening in a church will never get out. It does get out, more than you realize. And suddenly people who would have looked at the church and would have looked at Christians as people who, according to what Jesus said, should love one another, and that should be the mark of them being the followers of Jesus, suddenly they see division, strife, backbiting. And Paul is saying we can't have this. We can't have this because it can destroy the church. And we can't have this because it destroys the reputation of Christ in amongst the non-believers in our local community. And that's why he's challenging. It's really interesting that the two names, one means lucky and the other one means success. 
and I kind of, I kind of been doing some sort of preacher reading into the text, and I'm imagining they would have been potentially quite powerful ladies in the church, probably powerful personalities, and we find out later, as Paul describes them, that they contended with the gospel alongside Clement and the other leaders. They would have been really committed leaders alongside Paul, and that would have made a huge difference. But Paul doesn't care about that. He doesn't care that they're power players. He brings it to the church. And what he does, you would notice, he doesn't give any detail about what the problem is. And that's very smart, because the moment Paul would have given a detail about the whole issue, we would have had an opinion, thinking, oh, I think so-and-so is right. Oh, no, I think so-and-so is right. And it's almost as if Paul is saying, it doesn't matter what you're disagreeing about. What matters is the disagreement itself. And what I love about him is that he doesn't take any sides. He doesn't say to people, you're right and you're wrong. He's simply saying to them, be of the same mind. How does Paul solve this? Well, first of all, Paul is challenging to one thing. This one thing that he says to them, he says, be of the same mind in the Lord. Be of the same mind in the Lord. What Paul subtly is doing as a preacher and as a pastor, he's turning their attention from the conflict itself and from each other unto the Lord. He's reminding them of their identity. And as a hint, he's actually saying to them, submit to the Lord. Because whenever we mention the Lord, it is about submission. It is about the ruler, the king, the one under whose authority we come. So Paul is saying the conflict cannot be solved by let's sit down and have a discussion and find out who's right and who's wrong. It cannot be solved by sending a negotiator in who's going to sit down and say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? No, he's saying you've got to remember the Lord. And what Paul is saying to them is submit to the Lord. Be of the same mind in the Lord. He is the point of reference in this situation. And Paul brings Jesus into it, King Jesus, the Lord, into it. And he's saying, how do you guys relate to him? And that's a very uncomfortable question. It reminds us of what Jesus himself taught. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Jesus said, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar, and first go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. In other words, what Paul was remembering from what Jesus was teaching is that you cannot have your relationships on the horizontal be unaffected by the relationship on the vertical and vice versa. So we cannot go and worship while we've got a problem with somebody. And Jesus is saying, if there's a problem relationally, you've got to deal with that because it will affect your, problem, your relationship with God. The horizontal would affect the vertical. And you've got to do something about it. You've got to sort it out. You don't pretend. You don't fall out with loads of people and then go to church and try to pray or read the Bible and worship. It doesn't work like that. And Paul is reiterating that and he's saying, Remember, be of the same mind in the Lord. It's submission to him that's most important. But there's another thing that Paul is saying, and it's probably very countercultural to us. We like everything very private. But Paul is saying the conflict is being solved in community. The conflict is being solved in in the community. Listen to the words that Paul is saying after he calls them to be of the same mind in the Lord. He says, yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So Paul is asking this unmentioned, unnamed person, so the actual word is Sisychus, which could have been his name or her name, or it could have been Epaphroditus himself. Or it could have been Timothy, could have been sent later. We don't know who the person is. But Paul is asking that person to get involved as well and try to help them be reconciled. 
I love the kind language Paul is using. So when he's talking about these two ladies, he's, he's not throwing accusations, he's not shooting bullets at them, he, he's not being mean to them. He, even when he calls the third person to help them out, he doesn't paint them in a bad light. He doesn't say, oh, those two troublemakers, those two stubborn so-and-sos. No, he's calling them women who have contended at my side for the cause of the gospel, these were women that were in the trenches with Paul. These are women that he loves to bits. He cares for them. He doesn't point a finger at them. But he's saying they need help. They've gotten himself in a situation that's tricky and they just need help. And he's asking this unnamed person to get involved. Conflict is solved in community. We hate that. We hate that. So very often we find ourselves in a situation where community involvement is there. You, your, your reaction is, it's nobody's business. It's my private life. I do what I want to do. And sometimes that's prevalent in our society and certainly it's beginning to kind of trickle into the church where people are saying, well, that's, that's my private thing if I'm falling out with somebody. It's not. It's really interesting what uh, Tony Marida was writing uh, on, on this issue. He says this, if you as a believer are acting wrongfully towards your brother or sister. You shouldn't think, hmm, it's none of your business. It is the church's business because you're part of a body and your sin affects the whole body. Paul has no problem alerting the church to the problem and asking somebody to mediate. Why? Again, because Paul loves the church and the people in the church and wants the church to flourish. So conflict is actually solved in community. And again, Jesus gives us an example that I would say very often is one of the most disobeyed passages in practice in the life of the church. In Matthew 18, Jesus talks about the situation of conflict. And he builds in this process through which if you have a conflict with somebody, first you go and talk to them privately and personally. And then if there's no reaction or no recognition of, of fault, you take somebody else with you who's able to be another witness in the conversation. And if things, you know, get entrenched and there's no movement there, then you bring it before the congregation, before the church. And that's certainly not very practiced in the church. Very often in the church, what do we do? We um, pick up the phone and either text or ring one of our friends who we know. And I was saying in the first message, we've got this inbuilt radar. We know who's for us and we know who to ring who's going to give us sympathy on a certain cause in a certain situation. So we ring somebody who we know absolutely sure they're going to be for us and against the other person. And we get loads of sympathy and our ego gets really, really kind of fed with this. And then if that doesn't work, we ring the pastor and we say to the pastor, sort it out. So-and-so has upset me. I'm not happy with them. Sort it out. What are you going to do about it? And very often the, the, the very teaching of Jesus is being ignored here. Because what Jesus is saying, no, no, you take the responsibility first and foremost and you talk to the person. I was saying again in the first service how my friend Marcus very often would have this line with me. If I'm complaining about something or someone, he would say to him, have you spoken to them? And I'd say no. And he'd say, I don't want to hear about it. You go and speak to them. And that's hard and it's harsh. But actually... That's the way of Jesus, and that's the way of Paul. Conflict is being solved in community. It's interesting that when Paul talks about this, this group of people that the women are part of, Clement is also part of, he calls them co-workers, and he says, co-workers whose names are in the book of life. And I think there's a hint that Paul drops there. What he's actually saying is all of you, Euodia, Syntyche, this person that goes to them, Clement, and everybody else who's helped me, they're going to be in heaven. The reference to the book of life is a reference to heaven. So what Paul is actually saying, get a grip. You're going to be living together for eternity. You're going to be in heaven together. So you better get used to love one another. And that's an important part, again, is living in community and being part of a community and solving spiritual conflict in community. Because the whole community is affected. There's a situation in Numbers 12 where Moses faces some back chat from his sister Miriam and his brother Aaron. 
They have got an issue with one of Moses' wives, but then they criticize him or, or they get jealous. Why is God only speaking through Moses? So actually unrelated, but that's what happens very often. We're upset about somebody over one issue, but then we find fault with them on another issue, and then we complain. And guess what? God listens and God hears it. We kind of think, oh, well, you know, it was just my little text message to somebody else or my little phone conversation. God hears it. God's listening all the time. So God challenges them and summons all three of them. He says, come on, let's rumble. Let's get this sorted out. Let's get it out. And as a result of her back chat and, 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 and the, the way she was gossiping behind Moses' back, Miriam is struck with leprosy. And Moses is brilliant. He intercedes for her. But the whole camp, the whole of the people of God have to stop until she's healed and made well. What I do, what you do, what we do individually affects us all as a church, as a body. It's a bit scary. It's sobering, but it's true. That's what is happening at a spiritual level. And that's why it's important to solve these things in community. So how do we land this? What, what does it mean for us? How, how do we deal with conflict if that ever arises or when it arrives? It? So I, I want to put two things that I want to say to us that are really important. And the first one is this. Let's not be so easily offended. The culture in which we live in is incredibly easily offended and, and we are incredibly sensitive and, and, and a lot of the things are incredibly justifiable to be sensitive about but I think it's very difficult to live life in a community or in a family if you're constantly on a default position of I'm being easily offended every little thing upsets me every little thing I find fault with every little thing is just difficult for me so I would say just let's just just realize that we're living in community, we're living in family, and there's gonna be some things that are not gonna to be to our liking and they're not gonna go down well all the time, but we're not gonna be easily offended. So I think that's one side of, of things that I think is really important. And I'm saying this, why? Because often behind the easily offended thing lies self-centeredness, pride, attention-seeking. And that's dangerous for us in our spiritual walk with God because pride is so dangerous. On the flip side of the coin, I'm saying let's not be so insensitive and aggressive. There's no other place like the Christian community where people can feel they can shoot bullets, you know, and just kind of, you gotta take it, brother. You gotta take it, sister. No, you don't. And sometimes it feels like people have a personality transplant after they become Christians and all the politeness and all the kindness just gets taken away. It's like, I can say whatever I want. Because we're speaking in truth. Let's learn about being sensitive and polite in this. Even more so because we're in the Christian community. And the, the, the kindness in Paul's language is, is, a, is a great tip of how we need to do this thing. So I'm saying let's hold those things together. A, let's not get easily offended. And secondly, let's not be aggressive and insensitive when we're addressing conflict. But then, I think it's not an option not to address conflict and to let it stew. If you let something stew too long, it probably gets bitter. It's not right. It's not an option to gossip about it. And that's Jesus' challenge. And gossip is very tempting. Eugene Peterson, in, in, in uh, his rendition, in, in one of the verses in Proverbs, he says, uh, and I'm paraphrasing poorly, but he basically says, gossiping is like eating candy. It tastes good, it tastes sweet, but then it gives you a bellyache. That's what gossip does. Gossiping is not an option. It's not an option to take sides. Again, we've got to resist this. I think we've got to learn to listen to one another and be there for one another and hold off from taking sides because we don't always know the full story. And this is such a great temptation because when we take sides, it makes us feel better about ourselves because the person that's just shared with us, if we agreed with them, they like us. And we like to be liked, did you know that? We like to be liked. But when we're not responding and we're just saying, okay, I'm listening to you, I I'm taking this, but realizing that there's something else as well. 
and learning to bring it under the Lord. Bring it under the Lord. What is the Lord saying? How do we get the mind of God on this? I found that that's, that's been a case in which very often people are very willing and very keen to tell you about how upset they are about somebody else, but the moment you bring God and Jesus into it, they're like, I don't want to hear, I don't want to talk about it. I thought you were going to be on my side. The important thing is to get the mind of the Lord and to get that submission and to ask what God is saying in this. And to maintain that eschatological view of the future, the reality is if we're Christians, if we're brothers and sisters, that's the reality. We're going to be in heaven together. And, and some people might have a different political view and some people might like different types of music and some people might like different types of all sorts of things. The reality is we're going to be together in heaven for eternity forever and it's just so important i think to create a sense of connecting with one another in spite of our differences and learning how to let the things of christ strengthen us that that's incredibly important and right at the very heart of it is doing what ian was talking about that miraculous thing that can happen when the presence of god in us releases forgiveness patience love those things are not normal. Those things are hard. Those things are impossible in some cases. But in God, with God, as we submit to the Lord, humility, love, forgiveness, kindness, patience are possible. And that's what we've got to look for, for the life of God to flow through us. Where I'm saying, I can't love that person. That person may have hurt me. That person might have upset me. That person might not be right. But in Christ, I'm actually able to do this as Christ lives through me. Let's land on four questions that uh, might be helpful to us. Here is the first question. And it's quite powerful. Are you a threat to unity? Now, of course, my default reaction is, what are you talking about? I'm a nice person. I'm not belligerent. Not a lot. I don't fall out with people. The reality, Euodia and Syntyche were fellow workers with Paul. They were committed. They were prominent. They were really dedicated to the work of the gospel, yet they fell out with each other and created a situation of conflict in the church. There I say, it's not beyond any of us to be in that situation. Am I a threat to unity? The second question is, are you willing to be reconciled? When you get to a point where your back is against the wall, you realize it as a challenge, you've done something wrong, you've got into an argument with somebody and you got it wrong. Are, are you willing to be reconciled? Even if the other side may not want to do it right, are you willing to be reconciled? Or are you kind of going, no, I'm just going to be stubborn about this. I've known people who've left the church because they just didn't want to be reconciled with somebody else. And they're like, if they're going there, I'm not going there. There's a, there's a real hardness of heart sometimes. May God keep us away from that sense of not being willing to be reconciled. Are you ready to accept help? Obviously, Paul encouraged somebody, we don't know exactly who it is, this, this mystery person to be coming alongside his two ladies. Now, I can imagine that those Euodia and Cynthia, probably when, 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 when they got in the same room, again, if they went to Starbucks, the three of them, and let, let's say for, for, for the sake of uh, you know, uh, the argument, that Epaphroditus was the one that was supposed to be connected with them, or probably even better, Timothy, you know, and he sits down and has a latte with Euodia and Syntyche, they probably could have looked at him and said, you haven't got even any fluff on your face as a beard. Who do you think you are talking to us? You know, do you not know who we are? We're fellow workers with Paul. Timothy, you're only young. You don't know what you're talking about. They could have had that reaction. Who are we? Who? Who's going to come and teach us how to do this? But actually... It's so important to be willing to accept help when that's needed and to have somebody who comes alongside us and walks in a way of reconciliation. And another question is, are you willing to mediate? I'm telling you, this is like refereeing or pastoring. 
I find that sometimes with pastoring and refereeing are uh, very similar jobs. Uh, when you're willing to be a mediator, you've got to realize that you could be hated by both sides. But you want to do something that's right. Is God calling you to be somebody who's not going to be popular, but who's going to be used by God to be a mediator like the person that was here? Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this incredible example that we see here of a healthy way to deal with a difficult situation of conflict in the church. And we pray that we would always have you in front of our eyes. We would never get locked into our own selfish agendas or our pride or our hurt feelings preventing us from actually reconciling to a brother and a sister. And Lord, I pray that you continue to do deeper and deeper work in our church family of bringing us together under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you, Christy. Uh, it will bring you all great delight to know that Andrew and I have sorted out our differences. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, it was his fault. <laughs> Which just goes to show I haven't understood anything at Christie's. <laughs> it's not the point at all. Uh, we need Christ as our example. We need Christ involved in all these situations. The servant king, from heaven you came, helpless babe. Entered our world, your glory veiled. Not to be served, but to serve. And give your life that we might live. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him. To bring our lives as a daily offering. A worship to the servant king. Let's stand.
All right. If, uh, if you're in the Civic Hall, if you'd like to take a seat. Uh, if you're in your own home, you can stand or sit. Um, no one's going to see. So, <laughs> um, Just a couple of things before we close. Uh, reminders, really. Tonight, um, we'll meet on Zoom as a church. If you would like to come along, we're going to be thinking about the survey that was taken just earlier this year and uh, just reflecting on some of the things that came out of that. So if you uh, want to join uh, for that normal church Zoom tonight at 730 uh, then the, this week kind of follows a normal pattern uh, for the church week. Uh, so uh, connect groups um, go on and uh, the church prayer meeting on Saturday morning, 8.30. Uh, it, even if you have not come before, do feel free to, to come along. It's on Zoom um, and it's, uh, it's good to pray together. And just on that note, as, uh, as you go through this, this week, if you're meeting up with other folks from the church, uh, maybe going for a walk or having a coffee or whatever, um, pray for pray for the church, pray for what's happening, pray for each other. Let's, uh, let's remember each other, not just on those kind of moments of the week, but through the week as well. Let's, uh, let's share the grace together as we close. And if you're in the civic hall, it's on your sheets, but you may know the words already. We've done it a few times now. Let's share the grace together. Uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.